episode five of GSO Ocean Classroom Live. We're streaming live today to Facebook and YouTube, so hello to both of those audiences. My name is Holly Morin, and I'm a marine biologist and science communicator with the Inner Space Center at the University of Rhode Island's Graduate School of Oceanography, and I will again be your host today. Uh, last episode, we were talking about World Ocean Day, and today we're actually going to be recognizing another holiday, a relatively new holiday. Uh, this is International Horseshoe Crab Day, which is going to be celebrated this coming Saturday, June 20th. So you can celebrate your dads on Sunday for Father's Day. You can celebrate the first day of summer on, uh, on Saturday the 20th as well. And then we can celebrate horseshoe crabs. You can go walk the beach with dad and look for horseshoe crabs. It's perfect, right? Um, so one thing to talk about with horseshoe crabs, and my picture that I have kind of for my intro today is with my niece when she was much littler, um, but we always talk about horseshoe crabs. We see them all the time on the coast. We made a sand sculpture of them, and they're harmless. They look really scary, uh, but ultimately they're harmless. The points in their outer shell, they're for protection. Uh, that long pointy thing that you might call a tail sticking out the back, it's actually called a, a telson. It's not for stabbing. It's not a sword. Um, it's actually more like a pole bolter's pole. It's going to actually flip horseshoe crab over in case they are stuck on their back. Um, and they're actually, which you can see here, so they'll actually use that telson, jam it into the sand, and see if they can flip themselves over uh, so they can right themselves and move along, use those all of those different legs to move along. Um, so they're actually, the other important thing, they're very critical um, when you think about health, biodiversity, um, and other things across the globe, other features. International Horseshoe Day is going to offer societies around the globe an opportunity to really recognize and celebrate the value of horseshoe crabs uh, in our coastal ecosystems. Uh, unfortunately, many of uh, the populations of horseshoe crabs globally, uh, they're actually on decline. So um, some species, uh, including the American horseshoe crab, um, they're, um, they're listed as vulnerable or endangered. And as these populations decline, their links um, and important benefits to other species in the coastal ecosystem that we're going to actually talk about in a little bit, um, that is something that is being significantly impacted as well. So before I go to uh, introduce our content expert for today, I just want to remind all of you out there uh, in Facebook world, the YouTube land, uh, that this is the goal of these Ocean Classroom episodes is uh, to not only share some really fantastic information with all of you, uh, but to keep things conversational as well. Uh, your input and questions uh, are really important to the success of these different programs that we've been hosting. So please remember, you can ask questions at any time Time during the broadcast. So you're just going to type those into the comment box on Facebook or the chat box that exists there on YouTube. Uh, and then we'll get to those uh, as many of those questions today as possible. So today's guest is Dr. Jennifer, uh, Jennifer Mate, who is a biology professor at Sacred Heart University in Connecticut. She's been studying horseshoe crabs for over 20 years. It's fantastic how much knowledge she's going to have to share with us today. Uh, she's founded and then she leads Project Limulus. So, Yim, Lim, oh my goodness, right? Limulus <laughs> is the scientific name, it's the genus name uh, that's in uh, for all horseshoe crabs or most horseshoe crab species. Uh, and so, uh, she started that back in 1998. So, Dr. Mate, please definitely say hi to everybody, introduce yourself, uh, and let us know a little bit more about your horseshoe crab research. Hello, everybody. <laughs> I'm so glad that everyone's joining us today. Um, so I'm Jennifer Mate, and I teach biology at Sacred Heart University. And um, I can't wait to share with you all the wonders of this somewhat weird, but mostly wonderful uh, horseshoe crab. And um, um, we could actually start with the first question if you want to, Holly. Yeah, no, that'd be fantastic. So we want to definitely keep things conversational. So we're bringing Limulus or Limulus into the, actually, you have to help me, Jennifer. Is it Limulus? Am I saying it correctly? Perfect. Right. Limulus. Right. Because I'm we're bringing Limulus into the limelight, so there, I know my words were getting confused there. So uh, we want to make sure we set the stage with all the questions from our audience. And so I believe we actually have uh, one question that already came in. Somebody put one in right at the very beginning. Um, so they wanted to know if we, if somebody finds a horseshoe crab along the coast, uh, should they pick it up and return it to the sea, or should they just leave it alone where it is? Right. So that depends. If it's um, in the sand and it's right side up, so its legs are in the sand and it's near the water edge, it's fine. You can just leave it there. You don't have to pick it up. Um, however, it's stuck in the rocks or it was thrown way up above the high tide line. Um, just gently pick it up like a bowl of rice and carry it down to the water line. 
Um, if it's upside down, you definitely want to help it turn over. You just turn him um, so his legs are in the sand and their gills are on the backside, as you can see in this photo. And as long as their gills remain covered, um, they don't they can live out of water for 10 hours. So um, they're actually pretty hardy in that way. Oh, wow. So as long as they're uh, shell side up and they're yeah. gills protected between the, the their shell and the sand, they can stay out of water for 10 hours. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, so they're very good. They're not, it's not like a fish where they're just going to die immediately. So they, they uh, can survive quite a long time out of water. Wow, I didn't know that. Fantastic. See, we're already learning, folks. We're already learning. So remember, you can type your questions and comments in at any time. Um, it could be about horseshoe crab biology, uh, ecology, medical questions, field sampling, how Dr. Matei got her start in this field, what what intrigued her about horseshoe crabs. Um, and we'll again get to as many of those as we can. So I'm going to actually ask a question. I know we often refer to horseshoe crabs as living fossils. Um, are they really 400 million years old? I mean, that means that they persist beyond five mass extinction events how does a species live for oh, that so so their lineage their line of, of ancestors goes back 400 million years so we the oldest horseshoe crab fossils um, look though very similar to the horseshoe crabs we see today and in fact the, the fossils that they have say at the Peabody Museum in New Haven and Yale that we went to look at um, look very similar to um, the ones you see today. So the ones you see on your screen right now walked when the dinosaurs were there. These little guys, those are the ones that are 400 million years old. And can you believe that that rock is that old? But those um, animals have been around and survived all the great mass extinctions. And so there are survivors and we would hate to see them decline or go extinct because of people. Awesome. So um, we actually have a question here from Emma, and that will kind of feature, kind of feed into talking a little bit more about the features of horseshoe crabs. Emma would like to know if horseshoe crabs bite. Ah, so <laughs> the very first thing I want you to know, and all the kids to know out there, is horseshoe crabs are harmless. So they, they can't bite you, they can't sting you. Um, their mouth is actually in the middle of their legs, and they, would, think they eat with their knees, or is that right? For what? They, they eat yes, they with their knees. Too, with their knees. Yeah. So they have, they have, um, so they, even their claws, they look like they could pinch you, but they can't even uh, pinch very hard. They have very tiny muscles in their legs and they just kind of meander around. So there they are. So there's the little legs and I can, you can put your hand right on them and they won't hurt you. Um, so they're completely harmless. So we want to tell everyone not to harm them because they won't harm you. Perfect. And then their lungs are called book lungs? Well, they have gills. So gills. Book yeah. gills. The reason we call them book gills is because they have a leather flap, as you can see here, mm -hmm. and it, it's like the, the cover of a book. And inside are little layers of tissue um, that look like pages of a book. And that's how they um, get oxygen from the water uh, through the gill tissue. Um, th that is similar to a fish. It has uh, tissues to breathe in the water. All right, fantastic. I love this. And I'm, I love all this amazing footage that we're sharing with all of you too, that are showing you all these different features of the horseshoe crab and where they're thriving in the coastal ecosystems. So we're actually looking at an egret here. So this is a great segue and another bird here, shorebird. Why are horseshoe crabs so important to these marine and coastal ecosystems? So horseshoe crabs will lay um, thousands and thousands of eggs. They have like tiny little BB blue colored, blue green eggs that they put in the sand. And for the birds, that's like a McDonald's hamburger. You know, it's like full of fat and protein and they will chow down on that. And they actually, the shorebirds that are migrating um, are dependent on the horseshoe crab to increase their body weight. So they can fly all the way to say the Arctic to lay their eggs in the spring. So they, a lot of organisms depend on the horseshoe crabs being around. So that's why we want to keep them abundant in our ecosystem and Long Island Sound. Okay, and since you just mentioned the that the eggs are kind of like a, a free buffet here to um, the birds, there we actually have a question from Charlene Tuttle, who was asking about uh, horseshoe crab eggs. She asks, are eggs fertilized in or outside the female's body, like the communal spawning of oysters and salmon, and where are eggs laid? Aha, uh -huh. so um, everyone notices that right now they come up usually in pairs, 
So the females in the front and the males in the back, and they come up onto the sandy beach or, or in the marsh, and the female digs a hole, and then she deposits the egg. So here's a picture of a female dug in in the middle of that picture, and a male is attached to the back of her. As soon as she lays the eggs, he fertilizes them, so it is external, and, and then she moves on. And sometimes you'll see three or four males all piled around her. So as she's putting the eggs in the sand, it's about you know four or five inches below the sand surface. So she buries them um, below the surface. And they develop there and hatch there in about two weeks. And about how many eggs will a female lay? A single female could lay 10,000 eggs. And so you can imagine if we have lots and lots of females, we'll have lots and lots of eggs, and there would be enough eggs to feed the birds as well. Wow. All right. Well, we, you got, uh, that's, I love this. I think this is fantastic. Um, so um, what, when we're talking, you mentioned, or we um, talked about that some species are, um, our populations are in decline. Um, so why are horseshoe uh, crab populations in decline? Well, there's a number of reasons as, as most species that are in decline. Um, we do harvest them. So we harvest them for bait. So they're economically important, but even uh, more important is we harvest them for blood products um, and the horseshoe crabs are scrubbed up and bled for um, and that's you can see their their blue blood right there because it's a copper based blood but there are little cells inside that we use to test our vaccines these are called amoebocytes and they purify it uh, freeze dry it and they can use a small amount of it to test vaccines to make sure they don't have bacterial toxins and then they um, are also very important um, ecologically, as we said. So we're getting a lot of questions about uh, medical uses um, that you just mentioned for horseshoe crabs. Um, so um, Arthur DeArezzo, hopefully I said that right, Arthur, would like to know when pharmaceutical companies drain their blood, so the horseshoe crab's blood, to test the purity of their, um, excuse me, to test the purity of their drugs, do they always return the horseshoe crabs back to the ocean or do they keep them there at, in the lab? So, um, so they don't drain them completely. It's only about 30% of the blood that they take and they return, the pharmaceutical companies want them to survive. So they return them to the water when they're finished. So a few horseshoe crabs might um, die from the process, um, but for the most part, they do try to return them back to the water. Um, and then just to get back to that one question, the other things that cause decline in the population are like um, seawalls that cut the ability for horseshoe crabs to make it to the beaches. So if we harden the shoreline, they have, their habitat is gone. So we really need to conserve our marshes and our beaches for horseshoe crabs. And then what about uh, red tide? So uh, Carol Leonard actually um, asked a question. She says, during the 2018 Southwest Florida red tide event, there were hundreds of dead horseshoe crabs washing ashore. Um, so that seemed to be an impact. And red tide um, is when there's a harmful algal bloom. There are algae that have toxins in them um, that, of course, uh, the other critters may consume and can impact them. It actually can find its way up to uh, higher predators, including humans. Um, so she wanted to know how long might it take for local populations to rebound? So if they are impacted by any of these different um, uh, negative uh, effects, how so for a red tide, how long usually does it take for these populations? to rebound? So um, the, the population's uh, life cycle takes a long time for a horseshoe crab population because the eggs take 10 years to develop as adults. So they have a long development time. And then um, adult horseshoe crabs will live another 10 to 15 years. Uh, mm -hmm. so we know that from their, the tag returns we get. And, and so um, for any management we do, like if we set aside areas where we're going to conserve and preserve them and not harvest them, um, to understand if that's helping, it takes a, a full 10 years before we see any rise in the population. So it does um, uh, take quite a while for their populations to return. And the red tide in Florida did harm horseshoe crabs and lots of other organisms, but horseshoe crabs are found from Maine to Florida, so they're, they're, they are found all over. So they're not they're not um, threatened with extinction. Um, it's just that their population numbers are going down and that affects their impact in the ecosystems where you know there's not enough food for the birds <laughs> if there's you know only a few horseshoe crabs. <laughs> so. Now is the American horseshoe crab considered endangered? 
No, the American horseshoe crab is, is listed on the IUCN red list, which is an international list as vulnerable. That's okay. it. We don't, if we're not careful, um, it could become endangered. So it's not on our US endangered species list. Okay. Um, and it, it's fine to harvest them. We just have to be careful how we manage them. All right, so and a way to inform how to manage uh, the horseshoe crab populations is, of course, by doing scientific research on them. Uh, so why don't you uh, tell the audience a little bit more about how you study horseshoe crabs and then share a little bit more about Project Limulus? Well, when I started looking at them, it was actually um, some kids on the beach in Milford that asked me if the horseshoe crabs that were there, do they come to the same beach? Kind of like sea turtles. Do the females always come back to the same beach? And I said, well, the only way we could really know that is if we tag them. So we started a tagging program. And then I realized they're all over the coast of Connecticut and Rhode Island. And to understand where they go, we need lots of people to help us. So we have um, kids of all ages helping us find the tags and tell us what they see. And we have tagging programs to get more tags out there. And we've been able to follow them where they go. And so that 50% of the time they come back to the same beach, but at other times they'll go say from Stonington, Connecticut to um, Napa Tree Long in Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. Uh, we actually have a question about where horseshoe crabs travel. So this is actually from Facebook from Katie Hanlon. Um, she would like to know how far do horseshoe crabs travel in their lifetime? Do they migrate? Ah, yes. So <laughs> they, the ones that we've tagged in Long Island Sound and including parts of Narragansett Bay and even on Block Island um, tend to hang around in that area. So we, we might tag them in Milford and they might show up in Stonington or we'll tag them in Stonington and they might show up in Narragansett Bay. So they go back and forth um, around the sound. They'll go across the sound to Long Island. So the Connecticut crabs like New York too. And um, um, the far majority, somewhat around 98% of our tag returns have come from within that uh, the Long Island sound area. And, but there's a few, distance travelers. We had some show up in New Jersey of all places. We had, <laughs> and we had some show up in Massachusetts. So just a few will go farther. Some of them like that, you know, <laughs> it's John, the longer John than the still longer. You always have to go a little further. Um, the tags that you're all that you're using, and so those are um, U.S. I believe are the U.S. Fish and Wildlife yes. tags. I believe. Now, do they impact the crab at all? Do they? Do they? 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 Do they hurt the crab? Oh no, not at all. It, it, it's kind of like getting your ear pierced. We just put a tiny hole in the shell, and we push a, the small plastic pin into the hole, and um, it, it actually heals over right away. Um, hasn't? We did a study, and it doesn't harm the horseshoe crabs in any way. So, and there, um, if you find it, there's a number at the bottom, and we need you to tell us what that number is. So that. That's kind of your homework assignment today. It's, you know, adults and children should go out onto the beach and uh, let us know if you find a tag and what that number is on the bottom of the tag. So there you guys go. There's a full moon coming up and this weekend, it's all perfect timing to celebrate International Horseshoe Day. We can all go out to the coast and go look for horseshoe crab tags. Be cognizant, though, of <laughs> keeping distance from folks. We all want to remember yeah, that as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 And yeah. then uh, you can phone that in if you find a tag or take a picture. What a great uh, little tidbit to have going into this weekend. I think that's yeah. fantastic. Um, so um, how many how many horseshoe crabs have you tagged in the whole entire length? of oh, Project? Um, Since, uh, like, 1997, we started doing this. And, and the original tags were my own um, tags. I had them. Um, on um, kind of a plastic string that I had made up. Um, and we put out um, 90,000 tags so far. Wow. So wow. here, oh, here's a picture of that little yellow string tag. If you find one of those, I would be really happy because those are over 10 years old. They're vintage, they're vintage. <laughs> but all the ones you see are gonna be the white, white tags, yeah. And those are the Federal Fish and Wildlife Service and they have a phone number on them. Or you can email me at Project Limulus, um, info at Project Limulus. Um, so either way.
Perfect. And then what type of, so obviously you're, you're looking at where the crabs are going. Um, and then, um, and if they return, is there any other uh, data that you are collecting through using this type of tag or looking at other uh, research or different projects? Oh, absolutely. So we're, uh, when we tag them, we also mark down their behavior. So were they mating together or were they alone? Uh, one interesting fact we found out that the population is getting so low in the sound that the males can't find the females. And so we have a lot of single females coming up to the beach and that has not been seen in other populations. And if she comes up alone, she can't lay her eggs. So we're quite concerned that um, there's not enough horseshoe crabs out there so they can find each other. Um, and, and we also found out that they do cross the sound. So New York and Connecticut and even Rhode Island should be managing their populations together because it's one big population. Great. So a reminder to everybody, uh, YouTube and Facebook, definitely keep sending those questions in. Um, actually, this is a great question. This is from Paul uh, and on YouTube. Uh, I think his last name is Matthias. Hopefully I said that right. Uh, what is the largest horseshoe crab ever found? Oh my God. How, maybe how big, let's try. How big can they get? There at the we, we had, oh, I'm trying to think. We, were, we had one that was uh, 32 centimeters wide. So we measured the, the sizes are measured across the width of the front shell. It's called the prosoma, but across the width. So, so it, was, it was pretty, it was like, mm, <laughs> like 18 inches, something like that. <laughs> wow, that's it. There, there are bigger ones in Asia. So the really big ones, um, there's a species in Asia that's slightly bigger than, than, our, than our horseshoe crab. So, and then this, do they, how old can they get? I'm assuming they get bigger as they grow. So Finley has a great question here. They want to know how old can horseshoe crabs live to? Okay, so they can live about 20 to 25 years but they stop growing when they start reproducing, start laying eggs. So they have a, what's called a terminal molt. So in order for these animals to grow, they have to break out of their exoskeleton, right? So they crawl out it's kind of like what insects do or what um, blue crab does. And, um, and they'll stop growing then at, after their 10th year. Great. And now Maggie would like to know, this is a great question coming from Facebook. Uh, is there any way that you can tell a male horseshoe crab from a female horseshoe crab by looking at them? Uh, yes, absolutely. So male crabs, um, if you look at their legs underneath, the front two legs have little mittens or a boxing glove, if you will. Mm -hmm. And those are technically called claspers because he hugs the female with those, with those little, little boxing glove legs. So the females legs um, all end in sort of scissor-like um, um, claws. So uh, this one's a male, see the little boxing glove? Ooh, it's hard to see, but the front leg there has um, a little clasper, almost looks like a, a glove on his front legs. Great, and then, um, so actually this is great, looking at this video, on the top there, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people often think those two bumps that are being pointed to are eyes. Are they eyes and or how many eyes is a horseshoe crab yeah. have? So they have on the on the shell, they have two big compound eyes. They almost look like dragonfly eyes, I, I say, right? So, um, and they use those, they can see, and they use those eyes to see each other. So those that type of eye is good for motion sensing. And so they'll see things moving by. Um, and usually the males after the female, right, to, to find her. And then they have, um, patches of cells around there, uh, the top of the shell, down the telson, and even on the underside that detects light. So people say, oh, they have 10 eyes, or they have more than 10 eyes actually, but those, those eyes really are for light detection. So they use that to sense where the beach is, you know, so on the full moon or during the day, the beach is lighter, and so they find their way up to the beach that way. So are they primarily, are, are there other sensory cues that they use then? Um, are they, do they use, I'm just, I'm asking out of curiosity. I mean, yeah. where I know light can be limited or vision is, is limited, especially underwater. Is there chemical cues or acoustic cues? Right. They've looked at chemical cues, not, not, not acoustic, acoustic. <laughs> so they don't have you, <laughs> but they can sense, uh, they can sense touch. Like if I touch the shell, they push my hand away. So I, you know, I know that they can, 
feel when something's putting pressure on the shell. Mm -hmm. And they can also, um, there's been evidence that they have a chemical sensory system. Um, and again, it's often to find each other. So the, the males cue in on um, the scent, if you will, of the female laying eggs. And so they are attracted to that, so yeah. Great. So let's flip back actually to the, the medical connection. I just want to kind of re, um, reinforce that because I think it's super interesting. Uh, and it's really important actually when you think of vaccination. So even the work that's being done right now, uh, looking at COVID-19 vaccinations as well, what makes horseshoe crab blood unique that can be used in this way? Uh, so there's a... Um like we have um, white blood cells mm -hmm. in their hemolymph or their blood, they have these amoebocyte cells. And it just means that they're kind of odd shaped and they can move around. And those cells for that, for the horseshoe crab, it's, it's really important because if they get bacteria in their system, these cells attack that bacteria immediately. And it's, a, it's an immediate test. If we have bacteria or toxin in um, a medical product, so when you get your vaccine for the flu, you want to make sure you don't get sick from the vaccine. And we use horseshoe crab blood products, they're called LAL, um, to test that vaccine and make sure it's pure. So it's really, they used to have to inject it into rabbits and see if a rabbit got sick before they could give it to humans. So this is a very fast test and it will make the production of a COVID uh, vaccine much faster um, because we can use the horseshoe crab blood for that. Awesome. I'm going to put out a final call to any questions coming in through YouTube and Facebook. Definitely send those in now. Um, I'm just curious. So their blood is blue. Is there a reason uh, what in their blood makes it blue? Right. So the, um, the pigment that carries oxygen around to their tissues is mm -hmm. copper. Mm -hmm. And so when it's exposed to oxygen, it turns blue. And yours and little kids, you, you have iron in yours to carry. It's a carrier for oxygen and CO2. And so um, when uh, your blood is exposed to the air, it turns red. So there you go. <laughs> I love it. Physiology lesson. Of I love it. I love it. Great. Uh, so we had a question that came in through YouTube. Um, and so we, you had mentioned Asia. Uh, is there other locations across the globe where uh, horseshoe crabs are located? Right. So they're, they're fairly restricted in their um, locations, but they're uh, found throughout East Asia. And so uh, the most northern part is in Japan. So the southern island of Japan has horseshoe crabs. Then in, um, they're found in China, Taiwan, all the way down Malaysia to India, um, also um, Vietnam and Thailand. So all of um, East Asia have, and there are three species. One lives in mangroves and the other two are very similar to our horseshoe crab living in beaches, mud flats, marshes. So that's a picture from Delaware Bay where they have millions come up um, at this time of year. So fascinating. So uh, one last question. Okay, we'll wrap things up with this one. Uh, do the tags pick up other information like water temperature, this is coming from Facebook, and currents or water pollution? So do you have multi-purpose tags that you put out um, on uh, the crabs? Oh, so um, no, I haven't. These um, these disc tags are are very inexpensive. In fact, they they're free from the government, so that's why we've been using them. But I had put out and um, some um, sonar tags. I I uh, got a grant from Connecticut Sea Grant. We were able to buy some sonar tags, and we were able to follow the crabs around. And for the battery in the tag lasted a year. And basically, you know, they would come up on one beach. They would lay their eggs and they would go back and feed in the area where they had laid their eggs. Usually during the winter, they bury in the mud and they're not very mobile. So they have like a quiet time um, during the winter when the water's very cold. And then they wake up again in March or so and start moving. <laughs> Perfect. And now they're moving and it's a good time to go and see them. So that was one thing we always like to end our GSO Ocean Classroom events with a little bit of homework. This was a little earlier when it was still during the school year, but I think it's always nice to have a, a, a task or, or, or uh, uh, something to, to go and look forward to, to go do perhaps. Um, so um, hopefully everybody uh, through Facebook and YouTube through our event today, 
you've learned a little bit about horseshoe crabs. You have a newfound respect and hopefully a whole lot less fear um, about these amazing creatures. So some of the things we talked about today that you can definitely go do with uh, International Horseshoe Crab uh, Day coming up uh, on Saturday, uh, the 20th. Um, and there is actually, uh, Jennifer, if I remember correctly, there's a full moon coming up this weekend. New moon. Um, which is right, right, our new moon, excuse me. Yes. Yeah, it's going to be dark. It's going to be very dark. So yeah, you could take a flashlight out and go and look for them. You can see them during the day too. If you go out at high tide and follow, um, wait an hour or two as the tide goes down, you should be able to find horseshoe crabs. Um, they're, they're sparse in some areas, but um, they should be up the next uh, five, six days, you should be able to see lots of them. And remember to look for those tags and call them in. Yeah, so um, if you do find a tag, so the number is gonna be one, I believe this is the number, 1-888-546-8587. So it's 1-88-LIMULUS. Um, yeah. And then you can call that and report the tag number uh, yeah. as well. And then, um, you know, uh, a few other things that you can definitely go out and do. You can explore those rocky tidal habitats, get to know some of the birds uh, that are in the area, how to identify them, those birds that are depending on all those eggs, like uh, Jennifer mentioned. Um, and then you could, if you find a horseshoe crab, lend it a, if it's on its back, lend it a helping hand, right? Uh, right. Very gently flip it back over. <laughs> yep. Um, and that way, and, uh, and otherwise, it's good to go. We said that at the beginning, uh, Jennifer mentioned, if it's uh, if its gills are towards the sand, it's kind of shell up, it'll be good to go and you can just leave it alone. Otherwise, we find it flipped over like this. Yeah. yeah. Give, it, give it a little help. Give it a little help. Push him over. And remember, he's not going to hurt you. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And then, of course, thank you. Uh, let's say thank you to Horseshoe Crabs for all of our good health. Uh, even their dogs and cats. Uh, their rabies vaccinations, I believe, are also tested for Horseshoe Crabs, right? Absolutely. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer, today for sharing your expertise and your knowledge. Uh, I know I have personally learned a lot. And I think this was absolutely fantastic. For everybody out there on Facebook uh, and YouTube, uh, definitely make sure you check out the various websites, uh, which are going to be listed in the comment section uh, for more information about all the different things that were talked about today, uh, especially if you're get, uh, interested in getting uh, involved further with Project Limnios. Lim I can't, still can't say it. Lim <laughs> um, and there are great ways for teachers to connect their classrooms, so you can look into that for the fall as well. Uh, continue to follow along with URI, GSO, and the Inner Space Center on our social media handles um, so you can stay tuned for more of these GSO Ocean Classroom events. And if there's any topics that you'd like to learn more about, let us know. Uh, there's a follow-up form, a feedback form that gets sent out or that you can respond to. So that's a great way to let us know what you're interested in and what we can chat about in further Ocean Classroom events. But otherwise, thank you again, Jennifer. This has been fantastic. Uh, to everyone else out there, uh, be well, stay safe. Have a great weekend. Go look for horseshoe crabs. <laughs> Thanks so much. Bye. <laughs>